how to intro this because this is a beef initiative podcast but due to time constraints and uh the setup we have here at the studio uh on the software side we're we're, we're doing a cross-pollination rip here on tftc and the beef initiative yes we're uh we're innovating through it and you know we're just gonna do it we're not gonna sit here and bump our gums well we're gonna bump our gums but we're just gonna do it yeah what are we bumping our gums about today boys some texas history am i getting a lesson today I think you're part of the lesson. <laughs> you are part of it. Why? <laughs> you're you're a living example. Slim, Slim and Parker uh, had an idea for this episode. Slim texted me last week. Was like, "Hey, we're going to do a, a history of Texas episode. Would you like to join us?" I was like, I, I, I'll, "I'll join, but I don't know how much I can contribute to this conversation." Did you feel intimidated? Uh, yes. Well, don't. It's, it's okay. We had a lot of people that came to Texas that helped us get to here, and they were based, and they they did it for all the right reasons. And you know that's what we're here to talk about: why people came to Texas. Where do we start? I mean, maybe we pick back up where we with our podcast about a year ago before you even moved to Austin. Yeah, it was April when I was down here, uh, scanning the landscape, seeing if I can move my family down here, and we recorded that podcast, and that was. A big shove that probably pushed me over the edge. Yeah, it was April April bit devs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the one of the things that we talked about just over a year ago, maybe it's a launching off point, was that um, the, the story of Sam Houston um, to, to jog people's memory. Um, but kind of the context being that one – you know, I think that there's something deeply intertwined between Bitcoin and 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 Texas and 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 Texas history, really. But that um, that if you have the kind of context that the people that settled Texas were people who left the colonies to go settle Kentucky, Tennessee. A lot of people then, once Kentucky and Tennessee were settled, then moved to the last frontier, which was Texas. Texas really was still a wild frontier when when the settlers started moving down from Kentucky and Tennessee. A lot of people came from Alabama as well, but I believe it was 1836 is when, um, Texas's fight for independence really began. Mm -hmm. And, um, that people often hear the, the saying, remember the Alamo, remember the Alamo. Um, but what most people don't fully appreciate about the history is that we lost the Alamo. Um, and, uh, William Travis, again, it's kind of, it's remarkable because he was 27 years old at the time, but he was one of the, um, l- Lieutenant, I think he was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Texas army, um, that was at the Alamo and he sent a letter to Sam Houston, um, asking for reinforcements. It was a famous, uh, it's called the victory or death, uh, letter or the Travis letter where he basically said, you know, we're surrounded by the enemy. The enemies demanded surrender. Um, I've returned the demand for surrender with a cannon shot and we ask for all people to send reinforcements, but if, if reinforcements don't arrive, we'll fight to the death. Um, and Sam Houston knew that if he went to the Alamo, that he would, it would be over. The war would be lost. They would lose. And so he not only did not send reinforcements, but, um, he fell back and took the army, burned a few towns that they were currently that, that that he had the the army kind of stationed at, and they started falling back, and and there was a lot of consternation um, amongst the the ranks, saying like, "Hey, let's go send reinforcements to the Alamo." And Sam Houston knew that that would that would be the end of them, um, but then ultimately, basically in the fog of morning, uh, attacked the Mexican army, captured Santa Ana, uh, won the war, um, negotiated Texas's independence right there, and you know effectively on the spot. Um, so that was a story that we talked about about a year ago. And I think about it in many ways with the world seemingly on fire. It's kind of t- telling all the, the Bitcoiners, like, fall back to Texas. Come here. This is where the revolution is. We'll go back out and uh, and reclaim other territories. I'm going to save Philadelphia one day. I told one you day. that. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> So Perfect. that would just be the great, the, the best spirit to, to restart this conversation about Texas history and, and, you know, particularly, you know, the, you Marty coming down, you know, kind of last fall full time and, and you've, you've started to, to see and experience it firsthand. Um, and I think that it's no coincidence that, uh, really Texas is emerging on many different fronts as the, um, you know, a big next push in the world of Bitcoin. Yeah. 
So with that context set, what happened after Texas got its independence set at Santa Ana? How did this state become what it is today? Well, Texas map was, you know, it was redrawn so many times. And, and at that time, you know, we said we had independence. It was, you know, it was a treaty at the time. You have the Treaty Oak here in Austin. You know, Santa Ana and, you know, Houston, you know, there's the famous pictures in the capital, everything from 1836 and all the way up to 1878. It was just a bloodbath across the north part of the Texas map that we had drawn all the way down into Mexico. There was boundaries that were disputed. There was wars and battles that were fought. There was towns that were burnt. At that time, if you were coming into Texas, like my generation, my ancestors came into Texas via just what Parker said, came from Tennessee. Some people stopped in Alabama. A lot of people came up through Galveston. There was not too many safe passages into Texas. And so you had to be very deliberate. You had to follow type of, you know, pay attention to what was going on with Mexico, but you also had to pay attention to what was going on with the Comanches. The Comanches up in the Texas Panhandle, the Great Plains, the Yano Estacado, you know, the Comanches many years before that had been driven out of their own lands and they ended up on the Great Plains and they became pretty much, you know, very, very, very savage. They were, they were tough to compete against. Within that, you started having these wars, like I said, with, you know, you had the Texians is what they were called early on in the state of Texas. Well, you also had Camacheria, which was basically Comanche land. And so those borders had to be fought with the Comanches all the way down into, we had wars, the Mexican and Texas, the Mexican war, the American Mexican war. We had everybody, we went all the way down into Mexico city. So we were going on two fronts here. And so that, that story and that, that how it evolved brought a lot of people to the great new, the frontier is what we knew it. Why were people coming to Texas? It's. Some would describe in some parts of the state a desolate land. There, why were people coming from Tennessee, Kentucky, to to settle down here? Why were they pushing yeah. south into Mexico and holding the Panhandle? Well, the way I just it, it was a spirit. It was it was it was freedom. Just like uh, Parker talked about earlier, you you left the Northeast. You left it. You know, you left the colonies. You left you know that part of the South that had been somewhat established. It was still that quest for freedom. I mean, we were a declared republic. You know, a lot of people says, oh, Texas is its own country. No, we were a republic. It was very fragile, but you could stake your claim of sovereignty. That's why. I mean, it's no different from today. It's just the times have changed and how we declare sovereignty and how we circumvent around that spirit of sovereignty. It was freedom. Yeah, and I think, I mean, everyone has to read history their own way, but that when you have all of that context of Texas' fight for independence from Mexico in 1836, you know, basically it was a republic for 10 years till 1846 joined the United States, and there was the Mexican-American War in 1846 to 1848, then the Civil War, 1861, 1865, that for those 30 years, really when Texas was being settled, um, when you, and then, and then thinking about the border war and the still settling Comanche land, uh-huh. um, that the only real explanation for the people of why they were here was f- because it was the frontier, because it was really in many ways, the last frontier and that they were willing to, to leave relative comfort wherever they were relative to the level of comfort that wasn't here, that they came for the freedom right and i I think i joke a lot these days where it's like people don't come from california texas for the weather you know like it's not you you do not come to texas to you don't leave the beach or wherever your relative position of comfort is that even to this day people come to texas for freedom and then it was it was brutal and it was rough and it was um it was a hard, it was an incredibly hard life. Um, and when you have that appreciation for just how, um, volatile life in Texas was between, you know, the eight, 1820s, 1830s up until the 1870s, um, it was like night and day from what one would expect in the, in the column, you know, kind of back in the Northeast or even in Kentucky and Tennessee by that point. 
Yeah, and that's the that time frame from I think really it it stamps Texas from 1845 to 1878, and you know after the Civil War and everything, between 1845 and 1878, we were in uh, the Comanche Wars. It was nonstop, and you know within the that's what I know best because that's where I come from is Comanche land. That's where we established, like my grandfather established. You know, my family ancestral family started they pioneered into the Texas panhandle, but they had to fight those Comanche wars. They had to be on that, on the very tail end of the Comanche wars to get into the panhandle of Texas. I think the last battle was right there at Paladora Canyon and we had the Adobe wars. And, but between that, everybody's like, Oh, well, the Comanches were just in the Texas panhandle, but it, it went all the way down to the Nueces river Valley. And so what I like about it and what I like to kind of, kind of mirror us as that's developed the Texas Ranger. And so the Texas Ranger was an enforcement apparatus that were very wiry. They were very uh, loose cannons. They were pretty, uh, you know, they were outlaws in their own right, but they had that spirit that I speak of. It was that yearning for freedom. It was the great frontier and they were willing to do whatever it took to pioneer, to fight the Comanches, to fight the Mexicans, to fight the elements, you know, the wind and then the, the harsh environments that you get up in West Texas all the way to the the, the deafening heat down in the in the valley, you know, as far as, you know, Big Bend River Basin, you know, there's so many parts of Texas that are regional that are very harsh, but it, it wasn't about the weather. It was about be, being able to, you know, to pioneer into, into the last great frontier. Mm-hmm. And the Rangers were pivotal in, in winning the Comanche Wars, particularly with their innovation <laughs> with the Colt 45. Yeah, what happened with the Rangers when they first started out, you know, they weren't good. They were still, you know, they were still uh, basically getting off their horse, riding up to the fight, getting off their horse, very cumbersome. But what do you know? They, they're, 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 their enemy basically at the time were, were these Native Americans, and what they were, they were horsemen. And the horsemanship that they watched and learned from, the only way that you learned to basically defeat the Comanche, the Texas Rangers had to learn how to fight like a Comanche. So what they did is they adopted this type of warfare from both from the Mexicans to the Comanches, and they combined a lot of that warfare into the way that they are known for to this day. And then one of the biggest catalysts was the cult. And they, they started realizing that the Comanche could shoot 10 arrows at you from their horse, you know, and within 20 seconds, they're hammering you. Well, once the Colt came in, they were carrying two Colts. It was first the five shooter, and then it went into the six shooter. Well, guess what? Now we're matched up. Now we're going to ride like a Comanche, and now we can fight like a Comanche with the Colt. Yeah, that was one interesting, um, I think it, it was the time that it would take to or this is just like one relative kind of bearing on it the the time that it would take to reload one kentucky long rifle yeah a a comanche could ride 300 yards and shoot 20 arrows and so like you you know kind of at that point there there was no ability to compete and that the colt being and it was also not accurate to shoot from right a, a long rifle from you know riding on a horse which was part of the adaptation um but that you know, being able to have six shots and shoot accurately and, and really adapt, like l- getting destroyed, getting out competed. Like the Rangers weren't, it wasn't just like walk out and be fearless and, 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 and win the Texas frontier. They actually had to adapt like, like some was, was talking about. And that was, you know, I think, and if you start to read te- the, the history of the Texas Rangers, it's not all like lion eyes. Like they were, there's good and bad. They oh, they had a, they had their own like um, kind of ethic um, on the frontier, and and it wasn't all roses, um, truthfully, mm-hmm. but that they were not only instrumental in fighting the 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 wars against the um, the Comanche, but also the Mexican American War too. Mm-hmm. Um, that they fought alongside the the U.S. Army um, once Texas was a was a state, and they would they'd be the the type that you know they'd go into territories they weren't you know supposed to go to or or they would they would go 
you know, fight battles and ask questions second. Yeah. Um, that, that type of breed. Um, but they were instrumental it was, and it was all volunteer, uh-huh. right? It was, and I don't think, I don't even know if it was paid. Um, but when you read about the Texas Rangers, it was, um, it was a rare breed, a, a breed that doesn't, doesn't really exist today. Um, mm. and when you think about the fact that it was only 150 years ago, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. You talk about how they fought, they would go into, and they're notoriously, not, uh, you know, known for as far as the type of, um, you know, the warfare that they did wage was, you know, they'd go into a Mexican village and they would go in before like the, the, the army did the U S United States army during the Mexican American war. And they would go in and they would basically fight guerrilla warfare. They wouldn't really ask permission. They would go lay a foundation of like, hey, we're here. We're going to go take out some spots, and then you guys can come up and mop up after us. Yeah, one of the crazy stories, there's, so there's, and one, it's cool, you know, growing up around Central Texas, like it's, whether it's a county like Hayes County, with Jack Hayes was a Texas Ranger, mm-hmm. um, Camp Ben McCulloch, uh, yeah. he, was, he was like a, you know, one of the most famous Texas Rangers. But there's a story, and I think, I think it was the Mexican-American War. It might have been post-Mexican-American War when the border wasn't, was still kind of, being secured um but they needed to the u.s army needed to know how many uh troops were in a certain mexican army and uh ben mcculloch who was a texas ranger basically went on a scouting mission but needed a good count so he literally rode down into the mexican army of like i think it was like five to ten thousand troops yeah and as the sun was coming up and as they were getting their fires going he just ran he just rode his horse through ta- through the camp so he could get a good count you know, and that's like, that's the type of crazy <laughs> motherfuckers that, you know, right. just don't, you know, maybe they exist in, in, in certain parts of the, of the world, but, uh, but you just don't, you know, it's just like that, that type of stuff are the stories of the Texas Rangers and, um, how the, how the last frontier was won. It, it was fascinating because they, they were outlaws in their own right, you know, and they had the, they had, they didn't have to ask permission. And as we became more and more part of the United States, you know, of course, they got weeded out and weeded out, got politicized and everything. Um, one thing that, that a lot of people don't understand about the Texas Rangers is they're the reason we won the Mexican-American War. By far, they're the reason we won it. But they also, a lot of people don't understand about the Texas Rangers as well, is they were very good communicators. They were innovators at their time of communication. I always talk about sound, sound communication here this is what we're trying to do. Well, they they de- uh, developed a communication apparatus because they were defending the Comanche raids from the north, the Mexican raids from the south. And, you know, how do you do that? Well, they did a lot of night raids. A lot of things were going wrong because they weren't fighting the right kind of warfare. They had to learn how to communicate. They developed a peer-to-peer type of communication system that's still used in the United States communications apparatus in some forms of our military to this day. And how they did it was nighttime, you know, they use signal lighting, all kinds of different ways that they could they could communicate for many, many miles to where they started getting ahead of the raids and they were able to communicate in a way that nobody had ever seen before. And the type of philosophy and theory behind it is, like I said, still used today. So that's a great rabbit hole to go down into. And is this like what you see in Lord of the Rings, like the the, sure. the fires that they light? And mm-hmm. You just know something exactly. Happening. Yeah, exactly. They they were able to use lanterns, like I said, at night because you know Pony Express, all that type of you know. How can we get from point A to point B as fast as we can? How can we communicate certain ways? You get in the military, you know, you have signaling, the signal man. It was a form of signaling in communications that had never been done before. What were they using? They were using night. They were using, you know, distance and lighting. But what were they also using? They were using horsemanship that they would learn from the Comanches. So they were innovating from their enemy, turning it in and basically, you know, restamping it. This is how we do it in Texas. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing today. I mean, you're coming in from the Northeast. We welcome everybody into Texas, but if you come to Texas, you better get ready to innovate because that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And so stay on the history tip. Like what happens post Mexican American war, post Comanche war, when, when those wars are won and I can speak from it from, um, 
where I come from as far as the beef initiative. In 1878, we developed a, a cattle industry in the state. Of, the reason Texas is Texas is because of the cow, nothing other. You know, that was our store of value as a state and as a republic. After the Civil War in 1878, we had innovation coming strong. We had to go feed a nation. We had the steam engine coming. We had all kinds of things that were coming in and through Texas and across the United States. Well, in 1878, we established the cattle drive. We had plenty of cattle because of the Civil War. We had, you know, we had an unlimited amount of beef roaming the, the plains of Texas. So we learned how to basically harness that protein and start driving it to feed a nation and that's a fascinating story within itself um you know we can come back i'll let kind of parker talk about how we got to 18, 1878 in a way but once in 1878 in the cattle industry basically we started feeding a nation and right now in 2022 with the beef initiative it's it, we're right back in 1878 we had to develop the sound communications the sound money that had to be developed we had to do these cattle drives a new form of a cattle drive we had to develop these nodes because we were going from texas to kansas city we we're going to kansas we we're going to chicago and we we're doing these cattle drives in that way yeah i mean i think it might just be a good time to jump in that uh, the only thing i would say is i just always like to frame it and again mm -hmm. this is Everyone has to read history differently. But for me, it is always taking away the context. And when you, you know, hear stories about the Texas Rangers or the Alamo and the, you know, kind of period where Texas was independent and that, that, that being critical to a lot of the spirit that is here, that, um, it once was independent and it's part of the United States, but that, that, that history existed, um, is that it was a really rough time. And, you know, and it, and it was an extended period of time and it wasn't just wars being fought. It was, it was civilians on the frontier living in the harshest of conditions and that they were coming here in search of freedom. They mm -hmm. were, they were with all of those costs, they were willing to suffer through it because they, they wanted to be free. Um, and that when I, when I think about that in aggregate period of, of history, it really defines Texas in many ways. And, you know, we're all here and we can't, we can't truly fathom what life on the frontier was like and just how hard it was. But when you think about that kind of filtering of people from the colonies to, to Kentucky, Tennessee, to Texas, that there is a trend that forms over generations of people that, that filter probably anywhere else in the world, the people who value freedom more than anything, more than any other place in the world. Um, and that I do think even though there is not a direct link between that and Bitcoin, there certainly is um, in a way that is unavoidable. That, um, that, that, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or what Slim's doing with the Beef Initiative, which has a, a big part and parcel to do with, with Bitcoin and the, the entire spirit of decentralization, like what you talked about, Marty, at, at the Beef Initiative Conference in Kerrville, that it's not a coincidence. Even if you can't create a direct linkage between them, it's not a coincidence that so many people are coming to Texas to work on Bitcoin and that uh, it's spreading like wildfire here. Um, and I think that that really is because with, whether it's the, the search for freedom or the empowerment to be able to innovate, to, you know, you know, I'd love to hear more of Slim's version of history about kind of the early days of the Texas cattle industry, but then that involving into the, the, the oil boom and mm -hmm. um, the wildcatter mentality, um, that, that it's all linked in history um, and, and that that doesn't just happen by coincidence. It happens by filtering people and the, the nature and the breed of people that are willing to sacrifice pretty much everything in search of freedom. It's a good point. And I like to, I'm starting to combine, you know, some narratives here about cattle and you just brought up energy, petroleum, oil boom, all that kind of stuff. When you look at the cattle industry in 1878, what was that? We were feeding a nation that's energy, right? That's energy transfer. We were transferring energy to the rest of the nation. And so if you look at um, the cow as a form of energy, which it is, it's pure animal protein. It's the best source of energy that you can find for your mind and for your body and everything. 
So let's look at, you know, what did we do from the cattle industry? We learned how to transfer energy from the cow to the people, to the nation, right? Well, the same with the energy sector of, you know, the oil booms. We're learning how to transfer energy from oil into the nation, which we could actually innovate with. And that's, that's the best way to look at everything that Texas has brought to our nation and to the world and to our genetic makeup is we know how to harness energy and we need to know, and we did know back then how to deliver that energy in a decentralized way. And so with looking at the pioneers, I always go back to my grandfather and how he, he basically pioneered everything that he ever did in a decentralized way. And all he was doing was transferring energy within a localized community that was decentralized. And that's what I see as far as Texas being very, very strong. We can look at our energy sector in the way we want. We know what we know what's going on with the energy sector here in Texas. You know, it's not that we can't produce the energy, but it's how it's set up. And as far as the cattle industry, the same way, we know how to transfer that energy of the cow in a decentralized way within the beef initiative. We're getting back to those roots that we innovated from the very beginning. It is just so simple that it's complicated for most people to understand. Yeah. I mean, it seems like most people are completely disconnected from this type of hands-on experience of actually yeah. shaking your rancher's hand or understanding how energy is extracted and delivered to market. Uh, I, mean, it, I mean, even here in Texas, like um, food prices are going up here. Uh, there's talks of rolling blackouts on the grid, it seems that uh and this is happening not only throughout the country but throughout the world in a lot of parts but it, it seems like even here in texas there there's some um, examples of people losing connection to um the early stages of the state when it was forming and the the industries that were booming but i do i mean i did move here for a reason even even though everything isn't perfect i do think this is the last bastion of like pure innovation of what's going on down here with Bitcoin is incredible. It's palpable. It's definitely happening. And um, with the beef initiative as well, it seems like there's people like yourselves who really understand the essence and the nature and the, the, the ethos of, of what Texas was built on. And it seems like you're trying to spark a rekindling uh, in some way. Am I wrong? No, no I, I think that's right. And I think that um, it's also, it's broad-based, right? And that there's, like, I think we all, especially kind of just core to Bitcoin, you have to be, um, you have to be able to tolerate high degrees of volatility and high degrees of uncertainty, right? And you have to be comfortable in that element. Um, and that I think when people get down the Bitcoin rabbit hole um, and, you know, myself starting to go down the, the food supply rabbit hole and the energy rabbit hole, um, you, you start to, to realize that things are incredibly fragile and um, they're a lot more fragile than they probably have ever been in any of our lives. Um, and it's not, you know, Texas is not immune from that, right? Like m the, the vast majority of all individuals have taken a lot of things in their lives for granted. And the question just becomes, where and who are going to be able to to withstand that volatility and be able to figure it out, right? And I think that yeah. um, one of the great things that I think we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis that is that kind of palpable um, energy is more and more people saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about it. I'm recognizing that this is a problem. It's not just a problem with the money supply, um, but being able to, you know, rather than just show up to a grocery store that potentially doesn't have food on it and be like, well, what am I going to do? I'm not going to eat today. It's, hey, let's go help some ranchers understand Bitcoin. And and if they have a, a sound form of money, they're going to stand a lot better chance to be able to continue to to deliver food to market. And same in the energy world. Um, and that that it's yeah, there's fragility here too. You oh, know, yeah. um, it's a symptom of hundred year of bad money, right? Um, but this is also the place that that has the 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 type of people that that aren't going to um, fold with a little bit of discomfort that are, that are most likely to figure things out and that it can't just be one person or two people or a city. 
it needs to be broad based. And so seeing what's happening in Houston, um, this past weekend, Rockdale, you know, about a month ago when we all went out to Kerrville, um, you know, Midland, um, the oil field and the, and the meetups that are starting out there, San Antonio meetups getting going that you need people in a, in a decentralized movement, you can't have, you know, centralization and that people see the, the actions that others are taking and figuring out their own ways to contribute. And that only seems to be accelerating. And that, that's a beautiful thing to see. And I, I like this phrase. Um, it's in what we all have to remember right now. And Parker touched on it. You know, you have to frame history. Everybody looks at history a different way for us to move. For, okay. For us to move forward, we first must take a step backwards and we've got to look about how we got here in the first place. Because if you can do that, you can give an educational series to yourself. We have to start visualizing what decentralized communication, network building, node building looks like. And to do that, it, that's the whole Beef Initiative platform started with a two-party line system philosophy in which my grandfather used to thrive in. By taking a step backwards, now we can look forward because we can leverage what had happened in the past that how we got here from 1836 all the way into 1878. That was a form of decentralized communication that, you know, we need to start bringing into the Bitcoin space. We need to all visualize what a network looks like, that node building. You know, that's why we're bringing in these cities of Texas to, you know, Austin is the central party. Austin is the hub now for what we're doing. It seems like it's really getting traction nationally and across the globe. You know, people know Austin because of Bitcoin. Well, we need to build those nodes and all these to these ranchers' minds and to these other states and these other regions' minds, just like we did with the food supply back in 1878. We started building those nodes of decentralized, at the time it was a decentralized food supply system. That's where I come in and start painting that picture. That's why I'm going to do this Texas to Tennessee tour. We're going to reflect on Kerrville. They're going to say, hey, this is what happened in Texas. This is what we're doing in Texas. Tennessee, get on board. It's a Texas to Tennessee tour that's all pointing at Colorado, the next conference. What is that doing? That's building nodes across the south. Whenever I leave Texas, that's all it's going to be is node building. Node building, node building, dome building. I'm gonna, we're gonna orange pill ranchers and we're gonna ranch pill Bitcoiners, just like we did in Kerrville. Yeah. Well, Flip, so maybe, or some, tell the story of just about this weekend. So, sure. Cause I, I do think like people can kind of get the, the sense of things that are happening in aggregate and different cities um, and seeing how that's spreading, but also on a, on a micro scale. So this past weekend, um, the team at Riot and Windstone organized a, a meetup in Rockdale, which is where their um, large Central Texas facility is. It's somewhere between 400 megawatts and 700 megawatts. A bunch of us went out there, went on a tour of the mine. They, they you know, I recommend that people do it. Being able to go see a mine of that scale is, is incredibly valuable. Um, just interesting to see. But, but more important than that, we were, you know, at a meetup. The new mayor of Rockdale um, has a barbecue joint you know, probably 100 to 125 Bitcoiners, a lot, you know, people look from the local community, people came up from Houston, which is about a two hour drive. People came up to Rockdale from Austin, about an hour drive. Um, but then kind of on an impromptu basis, you know, I think Michael Atwood from Oshi wanted to introduce Slim to a rancher that was about 20 miles away uh -huh. um, that started selling his beef for Bitcoin and Slim went out there. So it's, it's just like those type of things happen just in a very organic way as people take certain actions. If Riot hadn't organized the meetup and if a bunch of people hadn't gone out to Rockdale, maybe that meeting wouldn't have happened. So maybe some just talk sure. about that story. Cause I, I think it's, it's valuable for people to hear individual stories about individual ranchers and how they're connecting with Bitcoiners. Mm -hmm. And then, and then when they, they understand those stories, they can see how that can replicate from rancher to rancher community from community. yeah it's a it's a great story and you know M michael with oshi and i and beef initiative have been working together for a while we've been you know we've been developing the partnership and the affiliation so we have you know we've been communicating back and forth i'm educating michael about you know, regenerative farming and ranching in the state of texas well michael's just coming across certain people well he came across amber oaks ranch yeah outside of taylor texas which is close to rockdale 
Well, you guess who found out, um, a Bitcoiner found out about Amber Oaks Ranch. His name is John. And she went out there and bought a half a cow from him because she had found out about the beef initiative. So she went out there and she started doing her own research and she started having conversations. She met him at a farmer's market. So you have this form of decentralized communication that started taking place several months ago. And none of us that are already talking to each other knew what each other was doing. But what we had is we had that communication structure that we're sharing that information with each other. This guy is out in the open. He goes to farmer's markets all the time, but nobody understands how they can have market access to them. The narrative of the beef initiative, uh, AK-47, Amy, she went out there and said, well, I'm going to go source and create a new market access to my pure animal protein. I'm going to find somebody that's close to me. And so sure enough, she finds this regenerative farmer and rancher. He had moved to Texas. He's not, you know, he's not from this area and he is a first generational farmer and rancher. He's doing, um, he's doing fowl, he's doing beef, he's doing lamb and he's doing hog and he's doing it in a regenerative way. Well, Michael goes out there and basically orange pills him. So now he is basically doing market access in a decentralized using Bitcoin. But all that happened is because we're in this decentralized kind of communication structure, it's happening organically. We're not having to go out here and solicit ourselves. This has happened because we are talking to each other in the way that we are. We have one thing in common is that we're in Texas right now and we're talking about Bitcoin and we're going to these places like Rock. I didn't know Rockdale was even going on when I came into Austin last week. But now that I've met John, he's coming into the Beef Initiative. He is now accepting Bitcoin. He has full on market access. John knows, I, th I think he knows, but now he's probably not going to have to worry about selling his product for the next two years. Because here we are, we have a decentralized communication structure that happened organically. And now he's going to be able to plan on how he stewards his land and his animals. And he's going to have uh, a very good relationship with all the Bitcoiners and everybody else that goes out and shakes his hand because he wants to tell everybody, he wants to educate everybody on how he's doing this. Yeah, I think a maybe a good way to distill like, your description of the decentralized you know, network of individuals going to these farmers, like individuals standing up and taking action, because that was one thing we were discussing sure. when we went to go get coffee earlier, is that I, I went on a podcast yesterday with Clint Russell from the, um, the Liberty Lockdown podcast, and we got into the conversation. There's a lot of, and I've been guilty of this in the past as well, and it wasn't until Tucker Max came on this show and then he was recently on Mark Moss's show and he's been spreading this message uh, of action instead of seething at the the people we perceive as enemies, whether it be the World Economic Forum or the, the government that is that many perceive and they definitely are messing up our world and aspects of energy, food, and money. Um, and we can sit here and seethe and, and complain and point and say, look at what they're doing. Or you can take action, which is what, this decentralized network of nodes, which are individuals taking action at the end of the day, getting up and saying, Hey, I'm going to go shake a hand. I'm going to go mention Bitcoin, open up that door. It just takes action and it could be individuals, right? And you mm -hmm. mentioned Amy, like yeah. Amy's just uh, a Bitcoiner who wanted to get meat and she got up, walked out the door and looked for a farmer. Like, and that, mm -hmm. that's the message I think I, we need to get through to everybody is like, it could be you if you're listening to this, wherever you are. Like if you're seeing these problems too, and you're like, uh, I'm still guilty of it to this day. I fall prey to the seething at, at the perceived enemy. But uh, some of the highest leverage things I've done is move here to Texas to work on Bitcoin, to start the studio, to get people coming through here, shaking Cole's hand, being able to get access to beef that way, and, and just building a network here of actually like getting up, having conversations and, and taking action instead of screaming mm -hmm. into the void on Twitter. Well, and I, I've seen that really, whenever I was in technology, when I was younger and when I was doing research and analysis, I was, you know, I was, you know, targeted to do a, a study on the division of interpersonal communication and what our digital world was going to do to communication skills. And one thing I do see is people think that they can communicate in a digital form and be very effective. You can in so many ways, right? We're more connected now than we've ever been but we're more disconnected with each other than we've ever been. 
and we do not know the the empowerment of being able to go out there and shake somebody's hand and have a conversation with them and establish that form of trust and that's what the beef initiative is it's about trust it is about hey going up to a rancher and saying you know, you've got to be as a strong individual, be willing to get out from it, from your digital space and go out there and put your boots on the ground and go to a farmer's market. I tell everybody the beef initiative, it, more than anything, it's an international lifestyle that everybody's going to funnel into because it is because you don't see it anymore. You look and you say, I feel empowered today. You think about, you know, let's, you, let's use Amy as an example. She'll be speaking in Colorado with the, the panel of women that we're having there with Katie and Jessica and everybody. But you look about how empowered she feels as, as, a, as a woman right now, that she went out there and established this communication structure with somebody that's basically going to make her life better. She doesn't have to seethe anymore. What she has to do is celebrate. And she has to honor that celebration of going out there and meeting somebody and getting to know what they do and getting to know them as a person and as somebody that she wants to be friends with for a very long time because they're going to educate each other in a very holistic way that is very personable and there's no division there. It's because they honor each other's and they have an obligation and they understand what accountability is whenever you actually do develop these relationships. There is no more dividing line whenever you come into the beef initiative and the type of decentralized communication that we're trying to set up. Yeah, and I think that the other thing is seeing it happen on a broad-based way of individuals taking action, right? That going out to, to Rockdale and seeing Brett, who's now Brett's Backyard Barbecue, who is the mayor of Rockdale, who's seen what Riot has done now he just got elected mayor but he's committed to helping educate his community he doesn't know bitcoin back and forth intuitively as money but he's but he's caught a signal and now he's wanting to help pay that forward and so being able to see brett basically accepting bitcoin as storefront and not exactly knowing how the apps work or seeing the ibex uh, or Ebex, Ibex? Ibex. E Ebex. It's Ebex. Is it, it's it's it? Ebex. Oh, is it? It's Ebex. Oh, I'm going to get oh, this no. right. Love is those guys really at Ebex. Ebex. But, but seeing seeing this small business owner easily accepting payment, but still, you know, kind of not understanding exactly what everything is, That's that seeing them experience it then kind of allows ideas to happen. And, and then you meet new people out there. And in my experience, it's, you go meet a lot of people, you feel empowered by seeing it happen in a broad-based way, and then finding the signal and finding the right people to invest time in going forward. You know, someone like Brett, and you see like, oh, it's not just going to be Brett. This guy's the mayor of this town, and we'll have a, a Bitcoin beach right here in Rockdale with a mine. Yep. T 20 miles down the road, Taylor is where the new Samsung facility is going in, the foundry, and you just see these big, chess pieces on the board um, and you see people chopping wood and not be, you know, I think that it, it's, it's part of human nature to look back and say the world's on fire. You know, like how, how are we going to get through this? But there are a lot of people that can do both of those things and being in a, in a community, which isn't just Austin, it's a Bitcoin community, even though there isn't a singular Bitcoin community, there are locally, and then seeing those in neighboring communities, it really does, um, like people get real energy from being in person events, but, but it's not just being around Bitcoiners, it's seeing people that are actually builders. And when you don't just see ones and twos of that, but you see large communities that are ever growing and that are spreading into different places, into different avenues, the beef initiative, small businesses taking Bitcoin, like it, it is a galvanizing force that inspires people like Amy to go take that next action um, and inspires, you know, someone that was at that meetup to see something like what Brett did at his restaurant and see all the Bitcoiners come through. And now we're going to talk about doing that on a monthly basis that, um, that, that those type of things are really being spurred at a root level because of Bitcoin. That is, that is the beating heart that's bringing all of these people, these builders, these people that are, um, even though they're cognizant of a world being on fire, more so than probably anybody else, also happen to be the people that are going to get up and do their small part to to be, you know, a small part of a bigger 
solution to, to a massive problem. Well, again, I think it's important to really hone in on that. It may seem like a small part, but the, the compounding effect of many people doing their small part has a profound effect. It really, I mean, you just, just reflecting on what Parker just said, as far as Rockdale, I met five new people at Rockdale I'd never known. And I've already had five major conversations with people that are funneling in this type of, you know, basically communication, organic type of galvanizing thing that's going on. And they're ready to go. And you have OSHI, you know, onboarding with OSHI is here. We're going to be able to bring that here really soon where you're going to have a, a link and you can go and onboard anybody into Bitcoin with OSHI and you're going to get sats back. People are really ready for this. I think we have laid that. Rock Devil is a very good example. I mean, I didn't even have time to talk to you for two minutes because I was meeting new people and people were wanting to hear things. And then those same people were going over and talking to Parker. Then they were coming over and talking to me. They were going over and talking to Riot. Then they were going over talking to Michael. And then they were talking to Brett. You know, people were seeing that these, these little micro nodes in that little space were being developed. Those are going to go out and create these other nodes that get galvanized and they do get spread out. Yeah. <sighs> And the same thing happened in Kerrville. You guys were there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't even get to communicate with you guys at the conference when we had a break or whatever. Is like I didn't talk to you guys all day because you were busy talking to ranchers, talking to other people that you'd never seen before. It is happening organically everywhere we go. And I think one of the most encouraging things is that it's happening rather quickly too. Mm -hmm. Like we start, we start talking what November of last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was like right at the first of November, late so October. Six months later, mm -hmm. you have a conference in Kerrville. You're doing your Tennessee tour. You've got something going on in Colorado. We're at Rockdale, like, and that's again going back to the seething and the 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 feeling of impending doom. If you stand up and take action, I think many people. I mean, if you're listening to this, I think if you do take this action, you can you'll surprise yourself at how quickly uh, material change can can materialize. Yeah, and I also think that that's why you know just a steady drum beat, drum beat, you yeah. know, Kerrville. It was Kerrville, then it was the Empower Conference, um, and then you know Austin Bit Devs. The first Austin Light Austin Lightning Developers Meetup was before Austin Bit Devs. Then the Rockdale event, then Houston Bitcoin Meetup tomorrow. Um, I think the San Antonio Meetup is really getting started on June second, um, and so that steady drum read of just always something happening. Um, you know, there's going to be the Bitcoin plus plus conference here in Austin. I think it's the sixth, sixth the and ninth. ninth. Yeah. Um, that uh, Lisa Nygut from base 58 and Pleb lab are co-sponsoring um, or co-leading. I should say that, that those things just that, that steady drum beat gets more and more people engaged, but also keeps, putting builders in the same room together, creating more connections between people that, that, that share ideas. And then those ideas actually result in new tangible progress being made. And that, you know, it is, it is reinforcing to have more and more things and events happening um, here in the state of Texas. But, you know, like, you know, Slim said something about Kerrville, which, you know, it's crazy that it was only, a, I think, a month ago. Yeah. You know, there's like the 23rd, 24th, it feels like an eternity ago. Um, but that, um, or maybe Empower was before that. And then. Yeah, uh, Empower was before yeah, that. Yeah, Empower and then. It's three weeks before that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Slim talked about having it in Kerrville because anybody who was out there was out there intentionally. You know, if we have a bit dev, someone might come to bit devs in Austin because it's the third Thursday and they're here in Austin and they just move, you know, take a five minute car ride. But if you went out to Kerrville for the beef initiative event, two hour drive from Austin, there were Bitcoiners I talked to that came from Indiana, seemingly flew either flew into Austin or San Antonio and then drove two hours. People flew in from Idaho to come to the beef initiative event. People drove from West Texas. Um, anyone that was there had to be there intentionally. Now there were a few people that I met that were actually from Kerrville. So, right. you know, but, but even they were there intentionally. Uh, and the same will be true of, um, you know, or the same was true of Rockdale, right? Mm -hmm. There were people from the local Rockdale community, but they were finding a signal that was Bitcoin, but the, there were Bitcoiners from the Houston community that came out, Austin community that came out. And when you put those group of people that right, they have to have some intention of why they are 
where they're at, um, that that is a very strong filter. And it is no coincidence that that good things that are unpredictable happen from those events. And I would expect the same. I, I'm hoping I'll be able to make it to the, the event up in Colorado in July. Um, but while we have something, you know, kind of really incredible happening here in the state of Texas, we want it to happen everywhere. Yeah. Right. And, and that, you know, going out to Jason Rick's ranch on, I think it's July 22nd, 23rd, the same thing will be true. Everyone that makes their way to that ranch will be there for some intentional reason. And when you put a group of people, 100, 150 people together that, that have uh, very intentional reasons to be somewhere and that there's this Bitcoin beating heart or decentralizing food supply beating heart, there's such a strong overlap that, that incredibly positive things will happen from that as well. It's a good point. I, I like to look at it like this. You know, there's there's a social anxiety, you know, across the world, especially, you know, here in the United States, we have it, you know, tremendously. I like to, whenever you show up to one of these events, you know, the trust is kind of already established because we have this common denominator that we're all looking at. That social anxiety goes away. The trust already seems somewhat established. You're actually building a new communication structure that you don't have to worry about all this other social anxiety that's going. There's no judgment. Hey, we're, we're all going to start here. We'll expand out with our communication and our relationship that we're, you know, the form of intimacy that's already there. That's why I, I like these conferences on how we're doing it is that, you know, I keep on saying this and people are going to understand what I'm talking about. This is a lifestyle that you can really invest into that you can really have fun with right now during all that angst, all the anxiety, all the strife that we're going through. If you want to focus on that and you want to keep on bumping your gums about all the pain and evil, go ahead. It's a shitty lifestyle. You want to come over here to where there's hope, there's innovation, there's a like-mindedness, there's that form of trust that is a form of intimacy that everybody's yearning for. This is where people are going to funnel into their actions, their intentional behavior as far as destination spots, and there's going to be a sense of agency to this that actually is a foundational layer to really change your life, you know, and it is, it's, it's pharma. It's a form of a health initiative. It's a mindset initiative. It's a beef initiative. It's a Bitcoin initiative. It's all coming together and it's coalescing. And that's what we have to go do across every little region of, of the country. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is the third party that people have been looking for. Like, yeah. like red versus blue. We need an independent. I'm like, no, you just need to take action. Like the, yeah. if you want change in the world, go be the change you want to see. And this is, again, adopting Bitcoin, shaking your rancher's hand and educating people about how mm -hmm. to do these things. Like this is how change comes. You don't, and again, I'm guilty of it. I'll be the first to admit, you don't see, All of us are. see on Twitter is, can only get you so far. Yes, you can get a lot of likes and retweets, but it's not going to put food on your table or actually put sound money in your wallet. Like you have to go act. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a difference between typing we all going to make it and <laughs> and like literally going out and chopping wood. And that when you're around those people that are, you know, through the through the uncertainty and through the discomfort are able to get up every day and show up. I think one of the things we, you know, I don't know where we were talking about it Marty, but you Matt and I um were talking about just so much of it is showing up and showing up and 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 dealing with adversity and dealing with the discomfort to be able to actually produce, to be, be contributing value and building, you know, whatever it is, you know, whether it's me building Unchained, you with this podcast, the Beef Initiative with the podcast, but the work it's doing um, and creating this network, but then also creating direct market access um, in a decentralized way takes a, a breed of people that are willing to, to yeah. get up, you know, with everything that's going on in the world. But it's not just, that each individual takes action is that when you actually put those group of people together, that it inspires more people to do that, to say like, yeah, why, you know, I'm not just going to type W A G M I on Twitter. I'm going to go chop wood in the Texas heat. Yeah. And it, it, what's fun about that is, you know, I, <laughs> I'm kind of a smart ass and I don't like people, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but if you're going to keep on parroting all this crap, you know, over and over again, you know, you and I aren't going to going to have a good time. We know what's going on out there. 
and it, it's it's a form of accountability that we all have to make appealing and you know that's how we from very day one i told you I said, it's going to be boots on the ground i'm going to go out there i'm going to sh- come this summertime i told you back in november <laughs> i said i'm going to hit the road and i'm going to go shake every rancher's hand across the united states that i can and for us to be able to sit here and see you know and talk about how we're talking about this is called proof of work this is we're applying you know we're bumping our gums but we're also going out there and we're doing it i get pissed off every day that everything is going on in davos everything that's you know going on even sometimes in the bitcoin space you know there's a lot of rent seeking that goes on daily for likes for you know for market access into a space that's being innovated by other people and then other people are coming in well, we have to remember, you have to become that movie, like you said. You have to become that change, that cliche that we have to use. Well, it actually is real life right now. In, in my space, you know, being from, you know, the startup days and the innovation that happened back then, I started the Beef Initiative by writing 10,000 words down, and I did a sub stack. And now we have the Beef Initiative. That's because I learned how to innovate when I was young, and now the innovation that is the opportunity of innovation in the Bitcoin space right now is some of the most fascinating times I've ever seen. I have no strife in my life right now. I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm meeting the most base people, and every day is flowing like water for me because of the way that we're approaching this, the conversations that we're having like right now with you guys. It's the only reason you and I ever met is because of, because of Bitcoin decentralized mindset. Yeah. And well, you mentioned the, uh, the startup days in Austin, this is supposed to be an episode about Texas history. Maybe we, we touch on that and mm-hmm. how, um, cause we, we, we've talked about Dell a lot, right? Like, uh, and how this <laughs> Let's talk, yeah. sort Let's of talk about the city. Those. And then obviously Austin's becoming like a tech hub now and people moving from California and New York. So what does, maybe we talk about the, the history of that startup culture in the late 80s, 90s, and what you guys envision the future of Texas moving forward. Yeah, there was actually, there was a story that I think Ryan, I mean, I'd, he- I'd heard it before, uh, but I think the last time we talked about how, you know, Michael Dell you know, University of Texas dropout um, and Dell Computer was a, a big spurring of a of a wave of tech moving in kind of all the concentric circles around semiconductors moving to the state of Texas. But Ryan Gentry from Lightning Labs, after I think we talked about that, reminded me or, you know, kind of reconnected a story that even before Dell, there was, I think there were a group of 19 or 20 um, patrons who all contributed a million dollars to invest in a semiconductor facility here in central Texas. And that really predated Michael Dell. I don't know how much it directly contributed to, you know, Dell being flowed. Yeah. It flowed into each other at some point in time, but it certainly contributed to it. But that, you know, when we'll, you know, we'll all go up and say how Austin's becoming the Bitcoin capital of the world and, you know, kind of recruit actively recruiting Bitcoiners to, to the city of Austin, there's things that are, that have, that have, the the groundwork was laid decades ago um, for this to be a place where Bitcoin was going to proliferate and accelerate and, and, you know, kind of help transform um, the next phase phase of Bitcoin, that it's not one person getting on Twitter and shit posting about how Austin is the Bitcoin capital of the world. It was, things that that happened for very strategic reasons that were out of the control of any individual or group of individuals as to why i think what's happening here in austin you know i think like dating all the way back to that history of how texas was formed the nature of the people that were here and action building upon action and compounding and then you pull it forward to the 60s and 70s and then leading into the 80s michael dell um, and that really being the foundation of Austin being the, the tech center that was away from the coast, right? And that when, when Bitcoiners look around the country and when they start to see Bitcoin for what it is and, and the ideals of freedom and then the consequences of taxes and the consequences of the world being even more on fire in other, other places where, where Bitcoin development really kind of 
five to 10 years ago um, were, were the primary hubs and not to say that there isn't still a lot of activity that goes on in New York or San Francisco, but that the all roads were leading to Texas and Austin always um, for, for reasons before we ever yeah. were walking on this earth, you know, and, and that they were, they were, um, they were there and, it, you know, you can say it's in the water, but it, it is happening for very strategic reasons because beyond us, Austin's a very liberal city, but Texas is a conservative state that has a lot of regulatory certainty um, and strong property rights and and favorable tax climates, fam- favorable to business to to starting a business, um, and then we have the energy that's that's core to to what powers Bitcoin and secures Bitcoin. So, um, and that that's just compounding in nature. So. I do think that the that the history of Texas and, the, and is core to it. The history of Austin emerging, you know, over the '90s, you know, really early 2000s and into the 2010s, um, and then you know, kind of the natural competition away from from places like San Francisco and Seattle and New York, um, you know, th- that it was a, a grand setup to to I think what what happens next here in Austin really is. I mean, I, you know, I showed up in Austin, I I drove straight to sixth street (laughs) when I was 19 years old, had $150 in my pocket, you know, technology and innovation wasn't in my purview as far as my future, but just because it was already, it had that little spirit of innovation. I mean, we innovated in music, you know, you had, you had a lot of things that happened in Austin way before, you know, the technology, which was, you know, it's fascinating to look at just Austin's history. I mean, and Parker knows it better than anybody because, you know, this is where he comes from. I show up from, you know, being Texan, I show up in Austin. Just by being in Austin, I innovated myself and I joined a, a form of innovation. Whenever I got into technology, this is how I got one of my first jobs into technology. I was I was traveling at the time I came back and I'd been studying networking, computer networking. And there was a small company that had a, they had a, uh, a, a classified in the, in the Austin American Statesman. So I, I answered that ad. Well, it was a small startup company. I was, I think number 12 in the con- uh, company at that time. This company started with $1,500 with three guys. They did it in their apartment, and within two years, that same company, and I didn't get to reap all the rewards of the first, you know, top 10, all that kind of stuff, but that company sold to Charles Schwab for half a billion dollars, and it was just because of the innovative spirit that, you know, kind of Dell that had, it was the same time as Dell. That was like 1999, 2000, just like Parker said. There is a foundation of innovation that got us here to where we are in Bitcoin. That's what a lot of people, once again, to go forward, we must take a step back. Why is Austin there? Well, it already had a foundation of innovation. Yeah. I could keep going for hours. Yeah. So you have to yeah. hop on a call. Yeah. I got, yeah, I got a meeting. Oh, you it's got, that time. You've got three minutes. How yeah. should we wrap this up in three minutes? What's your call, call to action, Slim? You always got to call, call it action. Call to action is going to go to the beefinitiative.com. Okay. We're selling beef boxes. Go buy your beef. Decentralized. It's Cole Bolton, KNC cattle. Everybody in Austin knows him now. Thank God for Bitcoin, right? Also, today, later on today, I'm announcing um, Bitcoin education for the North American rancher. I've been working on it forever since you and I talked the first time. It's going to be kicking off on June 6th. So go sign up for that. You'll see it on Twitter. You're going to see it on the beefinitiative.com website. Let's get these ranchers educated. And it, Parker was instrumental. The why of Bitcoin is how we're starting the education process. Then on June 1st, I'm going on the Texas to Tennessee tour, and I'm going to go from ranch to ranch, Bitcoin meetup to Bitcoin meetup, whoever will have me across the United States. It's starting from Texas to Tennessee, but we'll take it anywhere you want, but it's all pointed at the Colorado Conference, which is July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th in Crawford, Colorado. Go get your tickets because they're going to sell out. So let's get intentional and let's participate in this education. This road trip, the great American road trip is what I'm about to kick off on. And I want to meet everybody out there that wants to participate and and get involved in what we just talked about. Let's take it everywhere we can take it. Let's start the conversation. Let's start orange pilling. Let's start ranch pilling. Let's get some sound communications going forward. If you're on a seize, make sure you act. 
Don't seethe into yeah. the void. Yeah. Let's, let's have fun. Let's, let's tar- turn this into an international lifestyle. Let's bring fun. Let's bring joy. Let's bring truth. Let's bring trust. You know, let's, let's have a good time doing it. Let's do it. Go act freaks. Yep.